everybody. I think pretty much everybody's here. So the first activity we're going to do, we're going to do things a little differently today. You have what is called a pipe cleaner. Yeah, so these were used to clean pipes, but actually we use them for arts and crafts for children now. So it's not really a pipe cleaner. And I want you to shape it in any shape you want, but reflecting how you're feeling right now. So give it a shape that reflects how you're feeling right now. And there is no right and wrong answer, obviously. Okay, for those who just came in, you, you're going to get a pipe cleaner, and I want you to shape it in how you're feeling, in the shape of how you're feeling right now. That's a good one. That, that will need a bit of explaining. <laughs> okay, did you find your shape? Yeah, who wants to share their shape? The shape of their feelings. Oh, I want to know what that is. It is a shape of a steer. So from here to, you can use this steer and go to the top. Okay. So do you feel that you're climbing something? You're getting somewhere? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Who else wants to share? I want to share mine because it's a little similar. But So mine is like a spiral. And, and for me, this is the type of learning I'm doing here. Also learning from you a little bit. And then we learn more and more and more. And then it gets bigger. So it's like also going up a stair in a way. Who wants to share? Uh, mine is straight. <laughs> uh, so that I'm confident and like calm. I'm, uh, I'm in the tree zone, yeah, balance, peace. Oh, nice. What did they say, the ground base, the baseline? Baseline, baseline like I'm super calm alert. That's cool. Who wants to share? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Actually, this is a zero mathematical symbol. And uh, for me, today is my first day. So I can add anything in this zero. I don't know anything about this workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, somebody wants to share. So you see, we're, we're doing also, we're working on our feelings, but in a different, completely different way now. Okay. Uh, I am feeling calm right now. So, I, calm? Calm, calm, calm. So I thought to make a tree, oh. but it doesn't look like a tree. It's just, <laughs> it's just my imagination. If it's a tree to you, it's a tree to you. <laughs> Wonderful, we have a tree here. A lot of calm alert zones today, that's great. Anybody else wants to share? Over there? Anybody wants to share? No? Over there? What about the knot? Uh, I'm feeling, feeling very tired because I went to market, just come back. <laughs> so that is a knot inside. <laughs> this is fun. Okay, last one. Anybody wants to share? Last one. Uh, the mind mind is like this. The more you learn, you you more you get confused, you know. <laughs> so, but still, it's inclusive, you know. Everything is here. <laughs> so, hopefully, to learn more, you have to confuse more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, of course. More you learn, you you get more, you know, doubts, curiosity, sort of a confusion. Confusion is really good. That means something's happening. And not long ago, mine was pretty much like this also. It was during a workshop. It was like, it ended up like being all messy. And, and now I'm like this, so this is fun. Okay. Your turn. I can do energy shift. Well. Uh, yesterday, you talk about the messy things, right? So as a teacher, you know, should we be able to take out the right things from those messy things in the classroom we should be i mean when we do activities and a lot of things happens but we as a teacher you know a facilitator you know sh should try to bring what are the the required things what are important things from that is it i mean i'm just asking you what do you mean the, the important things like formal teaching you know every day in our life we do you know a lot of things but uh, all are not useful, maybe. 
I'm not sure, but so in the teaching, you know, it's sort of a regulated. We as a teacher, you know, uh, more elder, uh, much older than the young, you know, the young st uh, students. So should we be able to bring some good things from that? And and should we be able to segregate what is good and what is bad in that sort of, I mean, are you getting my point? Is it? So I think what's striking us is that we don't like to talk with shoulds, have tos, good, bad, because it puts so much pressure on ourselves. We just have to go with the flow and be. So yes, when it gets messy, for sure it's fantastic if as a teacher you can pull out, oh, what was, what was, what did we learn in that situation? Maybe we learned that this was not a good activity. Maybe we learned that uh, it's kind of fun to laugh and feel connected, but there's always something we can pull out, but maybe not the thing we thought we were gonna get. But never feel the pressure to get all the pieces and put it, it's, it will come. But it's fun when it gets messy to pull out what you did learn. Is that answering your question? Kind of. <laughs> I'm, I'm slightly, I'm hearing this slightly differently, so maybe, uh, so when it comes to social emotional learning, what Tara was describing pretty much applies. It's very hard to say right, wrong, good, bad, because from our experience, even when things go wrong, we are learning something important. So this is the cell component. Now, when you work with your own curriculas and you know, you have to teach math, maybe it's not the right time to fully experiment with the cell, you know? I don't, I don't know if this is what you mean. There's some like formal teaching that needs to happen in a school, but also we, ha we have to keep in mind the, the social emotional component and find opportunities where to place it. So I don't know which one answers more your questions. Is that, does that answer the question? Life itself is, you know, whether you're in the class or whether you are in the cell class or not. But my question is then how it's different from our real life situations. So if you are in learning in the cell, you know. Does it make sense? Yes. It shouldn't be different from real life. That's what we're, we're hoping that you get from this. We're giving you practical tools to kind of connect with yourselves, to connect with your students, to create those healthy relationships. But it's just about being who you are and having ah, self-awareness. Oh, I think that they're missing being self-aware. They're very reactive, this student in front of me. I need to work on some self-regulation. But it's, it's, it's happening every day in your lives and you're probably often doing a lot of social emotional education without recognizing it. And now it's understanding, okay, there's five key components. What's in front of me? What do I need to pick up on? What, what does this particular student need a little bit more help on? Or what can I do as a group that's gonna help my class? That's my answer. Yep. Yeah, and also like for me, whatever I teach is always from a cell angle. Whether it's a, it's a topic like English or French, or, or, or sell lesson for me, I always come from this angle. But I've had 10 years to practice. And at the beginning, maybe it was a little less, but now it's very comfortable. And for me, I don't have to change anything. This is how I do it. So slowly, slowly, it is part of life. So, okay. Can I do self regulation? Yeah, one, okay. So we're gonna just take, you know, sit down comfortably. We're gonna just take three deep breaths and take our temperature, see where we are. So let's do it. One, two, three, and, and see if you're in the iceberg volcano or calm alert zone. Okay, did you find your temperature? Raise your hand if you're in the iceberg. Sad, tired low energy emotion raise your hand if you're a little bit in the iceberg yeah okay raise your hand if you're in the volcano high energy a little bit in the volcano raise your hand if you're in the volcano and the iceberg both yeah both and who's calm alert today yeah so we're not sharing because we don't have time but we'll do a quick energy shifting exercise and I want to go back to the take one, take one minute. But today I'm going to ask you to do something specific. I want you to take one minute and think about your last holiday. Take a snapshot of that, your favorite moment during that holiday. You take a photo, then after one minute we'll share 
our photo. Okay? So you're going to have to see an image of something that you really enjoyed during your last holiday. Take a photo and then bring it back with you. Okay? So Tara's going to put the timer and we're going to take one minute. Start now. Okay, that's one minute. So now this is not about telling the story, but this is just describing a photo. So for me, it's Tixi Gompa with the sunset. Yeah, that's in Ladakh. Yeah. Want to, who wants to share their photo? I'm with my friend. I'm with my friend in Delhi after a long time in a cafe. Wonderful. Who wants to share? I was with my daughter walking along the road of Maglot, uh, between Maglot and Gangi, you know, this. Sadness uh, Tupa. Small puppies are there. Uh, I, I was feeding small puppies food that time. Watching Black Panthers with friends. I was at Pangong Lake with my friends. Oh, yes, it's in Ladakh. I was just watching the serial with my friend on the TV. Uh, seeing the beautiful scenery of Tarazun. I was enjoying the sunset. I was enjoying with my family. Before I went to Delhi, at that time, I met my friend after a long time. Uh, I, me and my father were uh, taking a snapshot of the beautiful flowers in Nepal. A landing strip from the top of a mountain nearby. I was at Dharamshala and uh, uh, during the morning time, the snow covered peaks I was watching. <laughs> Thank you. Mm, I was playing with my daughter and son. <laughs> during the last holiday, uh, I, uh, I was in a hostel and to watching Zombie movie with my friends. <laughs> I was with my sis and I was uh, eating Korean food with my sis. <laughs> Meeting my friends uh, after five years. Uh, it's October holiday last time and I was having a pizza with my mom, dad and sister in home. Swimming in the lake. Uh, I was just uh, riding my bike and enjoying the ride. Uh, it was a sunset at the Ganga. I was with my friend Lars Loser. I'm with my grandfather. He was telling a story to me. Mm, nothing blank wish. <laughs> I didn't went on vacation, that's why. I didn't went for a vacation uh, last night, last summer, so that's why I didn't have any idea about um, it. was during my uh, last uh, winter holidays. I was at uh, Ladakh, uh, there's snow all around. Uh, I'm having family time. Yeah. I was watching the sunrise at the Gat with Sophie and my new friend Nimla. Um, it was wonderful. No, beautiful. So I'm so happy to hear, hear all of your beautiful ideas. Did anyone notice how many of the special happy memories were with other people? Because that's social emotional learning is about developing strong human connection and relationships and that's the basis of our joy and and finding purpose and meaning in our life, right? 
Okay, shall we jump in? So today we're going to talk, um, it's going to be a day about intervention. So what do we, how do we use these cell tools that we've learned? Um, and before we start, we thought we would talk for a few minutes about stress. Um, because some of the teachers shared with us that, like in North America, here in India, you have a lot of students who are experiencing stress and anxiety and worry. And we wanted to understand a little bit more about what the research is saying so that we can figure out how to use our, our new good skills, our new tools. Would you be able to press the button for me? Thank you. So we're going to make the connection between is stress good or bad? And how do we make stress something that's our friend and connect it with our cell skills? So, really fast, hopefully in the next 30, 40 minute minutes, we're going to talk about what are the origins about, of worry? How does stress relate to self-awareness and self-regulation, the two, the me domain of cell? Um, how does stress impact our student well-being and your well-being also? And then how can you incorporate self-awareness and self-regulation into your school, your classroom, and your own personal life? Great. Oh, thank you. So, what are the origins of worry? So, I don't know if Sophie talked about the hand brain a lot. Well, we're going to get to that. So, our brain, in the middle of our brain, the limbic system is still based on how we existed in prehistoric times. When we react emotionally, we go into fight, flight, or freeze. So, if, and this is important because we need to protect ourselves. But the problem is that we don't have mammoths in our hallways and we don't have saber-toothed tigers running after us. You've got some wild dogs and some cows, but they don't seem to be too distressing, <laughs> although they shocked me when I got here. So, and the traffic, <laughs> but that's a good point. So what we do need is that we do need our body to move into fight, flight, and freeze sometimes today to protect ourselves. So we don't want to get rid of it. But when you're walking down the street in India and there's tons of cars and rickshaws, you have to be paying attention. And if someone's, if someone's going to almost hit you, you need the blood to fly into your limbic system so you can stop and freeze or you can run away so you don't get hit. So you need your body to react. That limbic system, that prehistoric part of our, or the, the emotional part of our brain needs to function. But now we need to start reflecting and asking ourselves questions. Am I in danger? Because sometimes before you go into an exam, you're like really worried and your heart's racing and you're stressed and you're worried you're going to fail. Okay, that's real. But is it life-threatening? No. And so we need to learn to tell our brains that it's okay, we're going to be okay, we're going to be fine. So this, this slide right here talking about the brain is talking about our limbic system, which is in the middle of our brain, and the prefrontal cortex, which is here, the front of our brain. And I don't know if Sophie showed you the hand brain last week? And you watched the Dan Siegel video. Okay, so you know the hand brain. When the blood goes into our limbic system, we flip our lid and we react. That's to protect ourselves, fantastic. But when it's not life-threatening, we need to ask ourselves, are we okay? Is this dangerous? And then we need to be able to self-regulate. Do these, take your pipe cleaner, take your deep breaths, tell yourself good messages, get the blood back into your prefrontal cortex so you can make good choices. If you flip your lid and your blood's in the limbic system, you can't think, you can't learn, you can't memorize, you can't solve any problems, you're just reacting and it feels real. So maybe you're gonna tell yourself, I'm sick, I feel sick, and maybe you'll become sick. For real, you'll become sick because you've told yourself, or you're thinking over and over again, oh my God, oh my God, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, and your blood stays here. You're not necessarily needing to be sick, you need to help your brain put the blood back into your prefrontal cortex so you can care for yourself. Okay, thank you. So let's talk about stress, you can keep going. How much stress have you experienced in the past year? Raise your hand if you've experienced no stress. Okay. Raise your hand if you've experienced some stress. Okay. Raise your hand if you've experienced a lot of stress. Yes. That's how we function in our lives these days, with a lot of stress. A little or none. Sorry, you can keep going. An average amount. A lot. Great. Next question. Oh, you have to go back one, sorry. Nope. <laughs> one more. 
Okay, so which statement do you believe to be true? Is stress harmful for you? It depletes your health, vitality, performance, productivity, and learning. Or is stress good for you? It boosts your performance, productivity, health, vitality, and learning. Raise your hand if you think stress is bad for you. Okay. Now raise your hand if you think stress is good for you. Okay. So we have like 50-50. It's actually both. Aha. De-stress and do Perfect. All right. Let's see what the research tells us. There was this, you can go one more, sorry, thank you. So these beautiful scientists looked at 30,000 Americans over eight years, and they asked them the same two questions. How much stress have you experienced in the last year? A lot, a little, or none. And do you believe that stress is harmful for your health? And then they looked at public death records to figure out who died. <laughs> That's all. One more. The results were astonishing. If you experienced a lot of stress and you thought that stress was harmful for you, you had a 43% increased chance of dying. However, if you experienced a lot of stress but you did not think that stress was harmful for you, you had a zero increase in your rate of dying, which was even less than those people that had an average amount of stress. So you could have a lot of stress but think it's okay, it's not bad for you, you're gonna be fine. The bottom line is that stress is not the problem. It's how you think about stress. That's the problem. So that's called mindset. So I don't know if you've studied uh, anything about mindset lately. Mindset is about how you think about situations. So you can think stress is bad for you and you can have an exam and you can get all worked up and you can worry about failing and you're probably gonna fail or maybe not do very well as, or as well as you can. And over time, if you continue to have that process, you will make yourself sick. And then you'll be in your room and not be able to go to your classes and not be able to function. And you will be sick and you need help. But you can change your health. You can become healthier based on how you think. So next slide, please. This was outside of a science lab in a high school in Montreal that I thought was really brilliant. So it says, it's called the power of yet. I don't know if you've ever heard of Carol Dweck, but if you write down Carol Dweck and you go to YouTube or to TED Talks, all her research is on mindset. Her research is fantastic. And basically it's the magic of the word yet. So if you say, I don't get it. I, I can't do this. I can't do science, I hate science. You're probably gonna be less successful in your life. Oh, thank you so much, tough gal. But if you say, I don't get it yet, you're showing optimism and potential. If you say, I can't do this yet, it's an openness to persevere and continue and possibly succeed. If you say, I can't do science yet, that's called growth mindset. You will be able to, because you're gonna persevere, you're gonna ask questions, you're gonna reflect. So this notion of mindset and the power of yet is critical. Doesn't matter whether you teach English or math or science or anything. You need to teach your kids that the way they think about the subject and the way they add the word yet makes a difference. If you fail something, don't worry, you didn't get it yet, but you will. That's what's important. So can changing how you think about stress make you healthier? Yes, it can. Research tells us. So there's this really amazing scientific research that happened that was called the social stress test. It happened at Harvard University. And what they did is they asked participants to come in and they were asked to pro produce a seven minute talk on your weaknesses. So present, so you're given five minutes to make a seven minute talk on what is not, what are you not very good at? And then you had to present it in front of a panel of judges. But what the participants didn't know is those panel of judges were trained to discourage you. So they were trained to be like, oh, so boring. Really? When are you going to stop? And they were just given negative feedback as they gave their talk. So what happened? The participants' hearts were beating faster. Their breathing was faster. They were sweating. Their mouths got dry. They started 
panicking a little. And we interpret these responses as anxiety and signs of not coping well. So we don't produce, um, go, we don't um, uh, réussir, what's that? We don't succeed as well. So, um, but then there was a group of Harvard students that, were, that came in and did the exact same stress test, but they were told before they went out and did their seven minute talk that when your heart beats faster, you're getting some energy to your body. When your lungs are working on overtime, there's extra oxygen going to your brain so you'll do better. All of the physiological reactions that we have that we think is that we're not coping well are in fact the opposite. All of the things that are making us like breathe hard and feel red are good things. They're making us get ready for something and we're going to perform better. And guess what happened? In the same stress test, when the, when the students were told that stress was good, they looked at their bodies and showed that their, when you were told that stress is bad, your blood vessels constrict in your heart and your cortisol levels shoot up. And the researchers think that there's a possible rise of heart attack and heart conditions because we endure a lot of stress in our lifetimes and our, and our blood vessels stay tight, 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 and it leads to cardiac problems. The students who were told that stress is good and your body's reaction are helping you to succeed, their blood vessels stayed open and loose. The same way cortisol levels go up too, but our blood vessels stay open when they stay open, it's the same reactions when we're in moments of joy and pleasure. And we stay happy, and we stay calm. And this study actually predicted that those people that think of stress as being good for you actually lived longer. Just knowing that stress is okay is a protective factor. So if you remember this talk, you'll all live longer. Thank you. What happens when we get stressed is we release oxytocin. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the, this, this hormone oxytocin. It's often called, called the cuddle hormone. So when you're in moments of joy and courage and pleasure, you're often with somebody and your body's releasing this amazing chemical that's making you feel good. But what people don't know is it's actually a stress hormone. So in moments of stress, it's also getting released. Now what we're not helping our students because if we have this oxytocin's released, it makes us want to be with somebody. So if you have a student who's experiencing a very big distressing event and they actually come to you for support, they don't have necessarily the words to share with you how they're feeling and what they need. So if you're lucky, they're gonna say, I'm so stressed, I'm so stressed, I'm so stressed, but that just makes them spin and we don't get out. I think what you learned this week is that if you have the emotion and you can name it, I feel stressed, I feel worried, I feel scared, and then they can connect it to a need. I need love, I need support, I need help. Ah, then we can take action. Because if you know you're stressed, and you can say, I stayed, I went to the GAT last night and I went shopping and I had so much fun, but I have this test now and I'm so tired and I'm so worried. Okay, you need some time, okay. Or you need help because you're failing, okay. And then it helps you to get out of that mode of distress. Oxytocin helps us to go and seek support. But if we don't have the language to then be able to say what we, how we feel and what we need, we're missing out on something valuable. So this oxytocin helps us. Oxytocin helps us to build our relationships, but it also is the secret ingredient to resilience, to building resilience, compassion, empathy. It's very important. Thanks. So how you think, which is the self-awareness, and how you act, which is your self-regulation, has an impact on how you succeed in, in your studies as a teacher with your students. So there is these very fun research that happened that was also looking at death rates. And they asked people how much stress they'd had in their lives. And then they asked people um, how much contact they had in helping friends, neighbors, family. It was about connection. And, what they sh and then they just followed the people and looked at death rates. And what they noticed is that if you had a major stressful event in your life, 
and you had no kind of need, no um, connection to a community in helping, you had a 30% chance higher rate of dying. But if you had a, the same major stressful event, someone dies, you have no money, your um, chances of dying were not impacted at all if you were in a relationship where you're helping your community, your family, your, your school, and it didn't matter. They followed people from the ages of 34 to 95. So it's quite remarkable how our bodies, um, this caring for others creates this resilience, and we're helping others, but it's actually helping us, the caregiver. So I'm just going to repeat. When you choose to view stress response as helpful, you create the biology of courage. When you connect with others under stress, you create resilience. And stress gives us access to our hearts, the compassionate heart that finds joy and meaning that connects us to others. So when you choose to view stress in this way, you're telling yourself that you can trust yourself, you can handle life's changes, you don't have to handle situations alone. Because I think often in our cultures, it doesn't matter whether you're in India or in Montreal or Canada, we often think that we're alone in dealing with things. And I find that particularly true of teachers. Teachers feel like it's their class, it's their responsibility to meet the needs of their students. And they forget that they, you should not be alone. You should be mentored by somebody older. You should be connected to other teachers to get help. You shouldn't feel like you have to be the best teacher for all of these kids in your class because maybe you don't have a good connection with a particular kid and you're struggling. So maybe it's worth asking your partner who's teaching down the hall, how would he, how would he or she help you? That helps you to stay healthy and to help your student. So this connection is important. So how, so we've just seen how self-awareness, how we think and self-regulation is critical to managing our stress response. Um, and I just wanted to show again this notion of self-awareness and self-regulation and how do we develop it. We're going to go fast because you already know the answers. Self-awareness, you know this, naming your feelings, um, demonstra having your, to demonstrate self-empathy, identify your strengths and challenges, have an optimistic outlook. Self-regulation is naming your feelings, naming your needs, figuring out what to do about it, take your temperature, do your energy shifters, which is the take one minute, the doing some mindfulness, whatever you choose. And this emotional literacy leads to better learning. Okay. Did you show this slide? I didn't know if you did. Okay. So the research shows, yeah. So if you have, if you implement social emotional learning in your schools, the research shows, and it's not like a one-time thing, right? You do it over over a period of time. So this research was based on five years. If you bit, if you had social emotional learning built into your school system, um, your social emotional learning skills go up. You have improved attitudes about yourself, others, and school. You have more positive behaviors in your classroom and in your schools, and that you have this 11 to point 11 percent. Uh, percentile gain on achievement tests. So you're actually, once you feel better about yourself and you're more connected, your students do better in school academically. And then, of course, it reduces um, your risk for conduct disorders, aggressive behaviors, and emotional distress. doesn't mean you won't see it. It means that there'll be less. And the cell skills that we've talked about are going to help you figure out how to help those who are still in distress. A really fun piece of research, it's perfect. A really fun, this is just showing that those, what we consider to be soft skills or non-cognitive skills are actually crucial. So so we, we often think, I think someone brought it up yesterday, maybe it was Dawa, that we don't really have time. We're so pressured to deal with content and curriculum. How do we make time for this? And so it really, we're just talking about how if you take the time to do this, Everybody's stress level goes down, they learn to self-regulate, their health, their relationships are improved, and you've got this um, critical component that everyone becomes happier and less distressed and just our relationships improve overall. Thank you. So I think you probably didn't use these cards probably as much as, <laughs> as we would love to, to have, but you can't change your thinking until you can understand how you feel and how what you need and then to self-regulate. So I wanted to just show this image in the sense that 
we can use the cards with a whole class, but we can also use the cards one on one. So when you start to after this, we're going to talk about real examples that you live. And so these are examples of kids that I've worked with one on one. So although I teach in a, in a classroom, I also have a private practice. So I work with um, students, with parents, um, and with adults. And when they come and see me as a psychologist, I always start with the cards because the cards helps gives words to how we're feeling and helps us to move forward. So this particular little girl, it's hard to see. Actually, she wasn't little. She was in her 20s. She was disappointed, depressed, and stressed. And her need was meaning and purpose. And we know the research shows that if you don't have meaning and purpose, you need meaning and purpose to have joy and happiness. Without that, it's a big problem. And she was concerned, anxious, and overwhelmed, and she needed to choose for herself. And there were, this is a kid who is suicidal and very depressed. And she felt that everybody else was choosing around her life, so she had no control. She had to go to school, she had to study, she had to eat certain things, she had to wear certain clothes because there was a uniform. Everything in her life was programmed, and she felt that she had no choice, no freedom, no flexibility. And she was in a very, very dark, unhappy place. And these cards helped to put words so that we could move forward together. This other kid, I think, is so fun because there's so many emotions and so many needs. And I just don't want you to be afraid as a teacher if you use these cards with the students because you might get lots of feelings and lots of needs. And then you can ask the students to start matching the needs with the feelings. What's, what's the need that's really, really important to you that jumps out at you? And let's figure out what's, what's the hardest for you. And then you can, it's hard to read, I can't even remember, but there was the need for connection, acceptance, and to matter. This kid didn't feel important in her school. She didn't feel seen at home. She didn't feel like anybody was noticing her, and she was also suicidal. But the cards look very different. But when you have the words, and they need to be accepted, and you need to matter, so how are you going to matter? What are we going to do, and who do we need? Thanks. And the whole notion of self-regulation, we've practiced it a lot this week. So it doesn't matter whether it's mindfulness or yoga or going for a run or taking water or whatever you want, just the idea of practicing self-regulation. So cell skills need to be taught every year. We don't have time, but I don't know that we have not time not to teach cell. We really don't. So 30, some of the research is showing that if you teach it 30 minutes per week, is kind of a magic number. So 30 minutes per week of explicit teaching, so teaching a literacy of emotion, teaching your needs, um, doing sticky feelings games, doing cooperative learning games is very helpful. And then you need to integrate it into your curriculum. So if you're reading an English novel, you can talk about the characters and you get the kids to reflect, what was that character feeling? What did that character need? And then it's the practice. And the practice is what's really important which is what we're going to talk about today. So there's the explicit teaching, integrated in practice and coaching. I think you know. Thank you. And very few universities actually teach teachers about cell. So we're pretty lucky here. And even fewer teachers reflect on their own cell skills. And even fewer teachers um, know about self-care, which is critical. Because you need to care for yourself in order to be able to care for others. You know when you're in an airplane and they say if the oxygen mask comes down, you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on somebody else? That's because if you don't put it on yourself first, you're dead. And then your kids or your grandmother has nobody. You have to care for yourself first so that you can care for the others. There's some really fun research out there that's just being, it was in 2016, that talked about as a teacher, um, they took the um, saliva, from the teacher's mouths, and then they took the saliva from the, from the kids' mouths. I think I mentioned this earlier this week, that if the teacher's stress level was very high, without even talking about stress, the kids' stress level was very high, first thing in the morning. So there, no teaching happened. You just walk in the classroom, take your stress levels, take all the kids. The more stressed the adults are, the more stressed the kids are. So you really need to take care of yourself, and you really need to do have a, a contemplative practice to be able to um, take care of yourselves. 
So, pardon? <laughs> so the idea is you just can't forget that you're the model. You just have to take care of you because if you're modeling screaming and yelling and becoming dysregulated, then your students are going to be screaming and yelling at each other and becoming dysregulated. That's not to say you can't occasionally scream. You just need to say, oops, I'm sorry. I'm totally dysregulated, and then you get back on track. Okay, that's it for the formal part of the conversation today. And the, I, I just really, yes. The mirror is that we're the model. As the adults, we're reflecting onto the kids. We're reflecting back to the kids um, what we want, how we want them to speak and how we want them to behave. So if you as a teacher are telling kids what to do and how to do it and telling them like this being very directive, then that's how they're going to be with their friends. They're going to be very bossy and tell everybody how to do it and what to do. If you're yelling at them, they're going to be yelling at their friends. But if we're modeling that we make mistakes, if we're modeling self-regulation, if we're modeling how to talk to students, I see this is really tricky for you. How can I help you? That's how we're going to be with, in our relationships with our peers. So the teachers are really the role model that the kids are copying. That whole notion of monkey see, monkey do doesn't change whether they're two or whether they're 20. Does that make sense? Yeah. I also get a confusion. Yep. It means something you're hiding behind it. Oh, you're hiding behind the mirror? Okay, I'm changing that picture. <laughs> Image gone. Thank you. No, we don't want to hide behind a mirror. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good point. I still say the slide goes. <laughs> OK. When you are showing mirrors to others, you can see the reflection of others. Of course, you can't see. But you are at the back. That's a reflection of others, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Bad slide. It's gone. Thank you. So we wanted to talk today about uh, intervention and how intervention, uh, how we use the cell skills in intervention. So what we were hoping is that you would come up with some examples that we can talk about how we, yeah. I just wanted to get them thinking about ideas. So if you have lived experiences that were difficult with your friends, with your students, in your schools, either with students or with other adults in your classes. It would be really fun to talk about them today and then we can talk about how we would intervene. So if you get you thinking about them, I drew this pyramid on the board to show you that when we talk about social and emotional learning and the cell skills that we've taught you, 80% of students are gonna benefit from those cell skills and it's prevention. When you teach those cell skills, you're preventing things from going wrong. So I'm going to just call it prevention. And it's called, it's, um, and these are universal tools that we're offering. So this whole notion of the me, you, and us domain, and the skills that you're training will help everybody in your school, adult and kids. But then we have this 15% of our population who are kind of tricky. We have 15% of our population who are really disruptive in our classes, who maybe have some learning issues, maybe are, we don't know why they're disruptive necessarily, but they're really causing problems. And so you as a teacher are gonna do the best you can, but you might need the help of your counselor, you might need the help of your, um, anyone who's in your, I don't know if you have resource teachers or support staff. In that 15%, you'll need a little bit of help with those kids. But then we have another 5% up here, and it's usually a 3 to 5% in every school. We have the top of the pyramid. The 3 to 5% are those kids who we need to teach cell skills for sure, but they're kids that need more help than we can offer as individual teachers and even as individual schools. So those are going to be teach those are kids who've maybe experienced some trauma. Those are kids who um, who are really struggling. Maybe there's abuse in the family, 
who knows, there's just three to 5% that we are needing outside support to help those kids. Depression, suicide, we can deal with prevention, but once we get to a very high place where someone is maybe cutting themselves and really at risk, we need to bring in extra resources. So I'm not sure what you have in your communities in order to build in those extra supports, but maybe as we talk about examples, we can, we can brainstorm together. Does that make sense? So I know during tea breaks or after class, we've talked about some of those really tricky cases. And so I thought maybe we could talk about some of those tricky cases and brainstorm together how we would, knowing what you know now, how do we help those, those cases? So anyone feeling brave and want to give a case? Thanks, Dawa. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so my uh, question is, uh, uh, from my last, from my experience in teaching, I found a lot of students are uh, are in the disciplinary problem. Yeah, like um, if I give a specific example, a girl of class seven, class seven, uh, who used to speak uh, things which a student shouldn't uh, speak to his classmate as well as to the uh, teach as well as when teachers near. She speak um, something which is cannot be like uh, in a very bad language manners. Yeah. So uh, from what I found in her is that uh, her parents were passed away since she was small, and since passed away. Yeah. Since then, I try to like uh, understand the student more who are having the disciplinary problem, and in common most of them are like a parental problem some are like single some are pass away so for that i feel like the needs for them is i being an elder should be like a parent for them and i try to give them some uh, feelings of like brother but still i couldn't fi figure out uh, specific and like I also cannot uh, go deep much into their emotional level because I'm not some, so much expert. So I wish to like listen to the how to deal with such things and what kind of stress they are going on. Thank you. Really great example. So there's a lot in there. I'm before one of the things we can, if we're just talking about a behavior issue, which we're not. I'm going to talk about your example in one second. We have a lot of kids nowadays who are just mischievous, misbehaving, and we are sometimes we don't know why. Um, if you and there's usually one or two in every class. I think that's our experience. Maybe four. <laughs> so I'll just tell you one kind of little nugget of information that you might want to remember: that some research is showing that you can have an 80% reduction in the difficult behavior by doing something called the two for 10. Two for 10 is, okay, two for 10 is when you spend two minutes every day for 10 days with that student not talking about school. You're just trying to build a relationship and get to know that student. And it could be, so it's two minutes, so it's not a long time, it could be passing them in the hall. It could be out when they're in recess. It could be when they come in in the morning. It could be at lunchtime. You sort of set it up so it's very informal. And you begin a, and you start to initiate a conversation with that kid. And it could be about what they, what they had for dinner the night before, what sports they like playing, who's their best friend, what acti whatever. Very casual, informal, but two minutes really connecting with the kid. It could be starting with at the front door before everybody comes into the class and you're making eye contact with everybody and you're saying, hey, I didn't see you yesterday. How are you feeling today? Just that little making sure everyone feels important. And then you build it with that kid. Two minutes every day for 10 days. And you'll have an 80% reduction. That's what the research says. However, if we're talking about Dawa's case, so we have a girl who's really experienced something very traumatic in their lives, right? You've lost two parents. She's, we can guess how she's feeling, but it's really fun to do these cards with those older, with those girls. 
How old is she, Dawa? Grade seven, you said? Class seven? Is that the same as grade seven? Yeah. Oh, high school one. Okay. It's really, did, I'm sure Sophie showed, well, we showed you these cards on the, on the film. But it's really fun to use these cards one-on-one, -on -one, alone with the kid. And you can ask her, how, because now that you've been using social emotional learning in your class, so that stack is a little bit bigger than the one that you've created. So what you're going to do is you're going to try to develop a relationship with this girl. You're probably going to do the two for 10 and just try to connect with her. And then you're going to, when you feel good, when you feel like you can, or maybe you've heard her say something really inappropriate in class, and you can't not do something about it because you've just heard it right in front of you, Whew, you're going to say, wow, man, that's, that's tough what I'm hearing. I think you and I need to have a conversation. You've named it in front of everybody that it's inappropriate because you want the other kids to know that that's not acceptable in your school. And then you're going to bring her into your office, and you're going to say, let's have a conversation together. I'm really worried when I hear you talking like that. I'm really worried because it makes me uncomfortable. It's not the way we behave in our school. And you're going to ask her to do her cards. You're going to add something? Yes, because I'm not a psychologist. She is <laughs> visionary. But when, as a teacher, I, I, I give help with the cards, my own state becomes super important because when I feel, oh, this is uncomfortable, I don't know where this conversation is going, I don't know what to do about this, or well, you're going to go see your counselor, okay, right after. Or, gonna, or you could even stop the conversation going, you know what, this sounds like a little, you know, it's a bit too difficult for me to help you right now. Why don't we get some more help? I would like you to come with me and meet with the counselor. Why don't we go together? So because we're not psychologists as teachers, this is the first line of intervention, but when you feel inside, and this is where your self-awareness and regulation comes in. This is, this, it's a kind of a meta-awareness. I'm helping someone and all of a sudden, oh, I'm worried about this conversation. That means you listen to that worry and you need also to get help to help that student. That's working, thank you. Um, so I, you would use the cards with this student before you know everything you know. Right now you know she's lost two parents, she's really struggling, she must feel these certain feelings. I would, I would get her to I would get her to name her feelings and put her feelings out in, and her cards and see if she can connect for herself because she might have no self-awareness or she might have some. If she has no self-awareness, again, you're going to be like, wow, this is much bigger than it is for me. And you're going to go to the school counselor and the school counselor might say, oh, this is too big for me too. And you're going to have to find some outside resources. Or she's going to be able to name her feelings and needs and you're going to be so impressed and you're going to be like, wow. She's going to name lonely, sad, hurt, heartbroken, and you're going to see, and then she's going to say what she needs. I need love. I need acceptance. I need to belong. I need connection. And they're going to be, wow, because you'll be surprised at some of these kids, how connected they are to themselves. And then you're going to say, this is really big stuff. Is What can we do in school to help you with some of these things? What What could we do as a team? And I'll give you an example of a student that we had at in our school. And there's multiple levels because even though you know that she's experienced trauma and you need to get the counselor involved or you need some outside services, we still need to figure out what can we do at school. We can't deal with the trauma. We can't deal with some of the psychological conversations that need to happen for sure. It's not our place. But we can figure out based on how she's feeling and what she needs by having you say, what can we do? Even if she says, I don't know. Just knowing that you are there to listen and that you're worried and that you see with her with the, her how she's feeling and what she needs is a huge difference right there. Huge. Well, just being able I to be present and listen. That last week we we did practice. No, I'm done. I'm just saying this active listening we really practiced a lot last week is, is really important. But also be mindful about how that makes you feel. Uh, and then when the student names their their needs like lonely want, uh, I want to belong and as Tara was saying then we can strategize wow you lonely how about we have a cup of tea twice a week you and I or who would you like to have tea with or you know so then you can strategize but often what we do is we we see the suffering 
and then we panic and we want to fix and we go into strategy. And that means the person has not been heard. So the suffering continues. We feel better because we think we've done a good job, but actually we're dealing with our own suffering. <laughs> we're trying to fix my pain seeing that kid hurting. Uh, so we have to sit with them a little bit with their hurt. This is the empathy bit. It's not fun. It's the muddy bit. But giving active listening, feelings, needs, and then maybe strategy. Now you're giving the whole, uh, what do you say? Well, it's the whole motion of active, li active listening. So feelings, fixing, doesn't work. So don't be, don't be afraid to stay with the need and not have a strategy. You don't know. But you can say, I see you're feeling heartbroken, and this is really hard for you. I don't, I'm not sure what we could do. I, let, let's try to think about it. But you might get something else, too. They might get a student who says, I don't know how I feel. I don't know what I need. I don't need anything. I don't need anything, and I don't need anybody. Because they're angry. And you can say, but you sound kind of angry. Do you think you're angry? Maybe. Then you go, then you got to go fish. Remember, we practice go fishing yeah. also with the feelings I need. So you might have to do a bit of that too. Yep. So when the kids are angry, you're, and you can start guessing. And you could be right and you could be wrong. But if you're wrong, they often tell you, no, that's not it. And when you're right, they're like, maybe. And you can see it in their body when you're getting close. But don't be af it's not maybe going to work the first time. And maybe the, nothing will come up and you'll say, you know what, it's hard for you. I can see you're, you're not really sure. I, I don't know either, but I, I know that you're suffering because I see you behaving in a way that's hurting you. So I need to make sure as your teacher within our school that this behavior is not acceptable. So that has to stop. But I also want to help you. So let's go see the school counselor. It's not about having the answers. It's about being there for your students and just offering empathy. Offering empathy, at this, at this active listening, is the beginning of a beautiful thing. It's not to say she's not going to be swearing in the classroom tomorrow. She might be. But then you're going to collect her tomorrow, and you're going to say, whew, it's happening again. This is not good. What are we going to do? And you're going to keep having the conversation. Were you going to ask a question? Uh, I think that if you if a student is angry, I think it's not the right time to talk. Because uh, there, there is a, a writer whose whose name is Jane Harich, or yeah. I don't know, I don't remember the exact names, but he said in an article uh, called "The Art The Art of Persuasions," you should not you should know the right time to pursue them. Yeah. You should also use your bo positive body language yeah. in order in order to pursue them. You're totally right. So if someone's in the volcano or in the iceberg and it's extreme, not the right time. But if you're just you're reflecting back, I don't want to talk. I don't know. What I'm, I'm not feeling anything. I don't care. You can then say what you think they're feeling. It's not you're gonna, not going to go farther than that necessarily with that student, because like you're saying, you need to know: is it the right time or the wrong time? Can I step in, or do I have to step back? And you're teach and you're modeling that for the kids too. So I mentioned that the, a mother committed suicide last year in our community. These, her, one of she has two children in our school, and one of uh, well, her her daughter is extremely angry. She's not in the volcano all the time; it's a dormant volcano, and we still need to address it. So, uh, as the adult, you have, as Tara was saying, to evaluate where they are on their thermometer, and for sure, like when it's a full-blown volcano or iceberg, this is not the right time. But this anger is ongoing. And it has to be addressed when it's the right moment. But she she doesn't look like she's in high emotions. You know, she she just looks like you and me. But we know inside there's a great deal of pain and anger. Perhaps I just want to add to that. Sometimes if we keep waiting for the right time, like ma'am just hinted out, it'd be late. You don't want those emotions to go in cold and, and you know be suppressed enough. Then these what would I say, the spontaneity, the access to the person's emotion it should not be delayed too much. So it's, it's yes, if it's too high, too, too boiling, yes, not at that time, but not too delayed also. And, and we are talking about the 5%, you know, type of situation in, uh, in children. So it has to be addressed, as Vishnu was saying, we need to find the right moment. And if we don't, actually, you're going to see behavior. 
happen all of a sudden. <laughs> you will have to address it in another way because some behavior will happen. Uh, I just want to ask you one thing. Uh, What we learn from Buddhist philosophy is that uh, how to work on your mind at that very, you know, not at the dormant state, but uh, when it is active at a certain level. And then we also think about, you know, get rid even at the dormant state, not to be there, not let it be there at the dormant state. So therefore, it's a very, uh, it is a very kind of, uh, uh, beneficial, practical, and which really goes deep into our mental state. And then, you know, how these things happen, then we go deep down, you know, below the emotion, emotional state, that is, uh, understanding of the reality, right? So, the understanding of the reality changes the whole scenario, right? Uh, what kind, what kind of perceptions you have on the basis of which you, you know, develop certain emotions. If you have the understanding and perception of the reality, then all these w won't happen, right? So that is why in Buddhism, marikpa or avidya or ignorance is the very root of all the negative emotions, right? Very, very root of. So we can take the, when we are not talking about, uh, we may not talk about the ignorance of ultimate reality, but even at the very uh, mundane kind of, you know, situation, ignorance works there, you know. Because of our, our ignorance, we are not able to understand, right? The example that I usually give is, uh, you know, you met uh, one of your very closest friend and he did not speak to you and and just passed you and then you get annoyed that why he has not spoken and then you speculate lots of things and then started re reflecting or reacting on that right? make conclusions and then react that oh this is a very unfair on on me that he has not even greeted me right so next day if you learn that he will he had a very unfortunate kind of, you know, incident with him. And then because of which uh, he did not even realize that you were, you know, passing by him. And uh, so by that time, then you may realize that, oh, it was wrong on my part that uh, uh, I shouldn't have concluded uh, that way. So if you would have understood the reality at that time, and uh, even though you may not, uh, you know, understand the reality, but uh, if you do not uh, conclude at such a stand, oh, this could be certain things, there could be many possibilities, and then try to understand the reality, then the whole situation, your em emotion won't go to that level and also won't react you know, negatively. So everything is very much based on the understanding of reality. Right? Yeah. So therefore, it is very important. Buddhist psychology is extremely deep, and we, as we, I said, we talk about eradicating, eliminating these negative emotions, let alone reducing them, right? So, but that is a little bit uh, too high or too distant kind of, uh, you know, to reach. <laughs> but uh, if really we can work on daily basis to reduce our negative emotions, that m can make you much happier. And because of that, and due to that, you can make your family and your community much happier, your colleagues much happier. And uh, thereby, you can make the society much happier, right? So this is a direct kind of uh, the consequences. And uh, I often used to say that it is much faster than the two-minute noodle. We can do it instantly and get the you know benefit. It's very very you know doable, very very doable, and you can see the benefit. Otherwise, what would have happened? You can. You know, you can see uh, if you would not have, you know, control your emotion, 
what could happen, right? And since you are able to control it, now you are in a much better state, much, much happier, right? So the emotion, literacy about emotion, and then to train how to regulate your emotions and tr through mind training processes is extremely important and extremely beneficial. And if you really work on it, then instantly you will get the results. You can feel the result, right? Hmm. So tomorrow is the last day, isn't it? Tomorrow is the last day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Permit me to show you our poster, and I will show you. Yeah, please, please, you yes. With your example with our children. I see. Absolutely, yes. And understanding the nature of reality. Yes, yes. Maybe at the conventional level. Yes, at yeah, the conventional, level. right, right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And often these days happen when you call, make a call and the other person, you know, did not receive it. And then you just conclude that, oh, he is not picking up his, you know, phone. <laughs> and the, the com you know, the telephone companies, they also, you know, sometimes uh, when the other person is not available, what do you get the message? The, uh, no, uh, the, the person you are uh, not available is the best one. Is not responding. Uh, is he is not responding? That is not true. You see, uh, but uh, he is not available is a very good kind of you know language. If he in the company has this message that uh, he does not respond, then that is uh, really uh, yeah that makes you angry, right? And uh, similarly, we should uh, think about, you know, oh, the person may not be near the phone or um, must be engaged, you know, maybe in the, in the meeting or something like that. That will cool down yourself. Otherwise, if you imagine that the phone is there, he has time, and he is not picking up, knowing that this, is, this call is from you, then you will, you know, yeah, yeah. Right. You may break your phone, <laughs> which, ult which ultimately is your loss, right? Yeah, and be in yeah. the volcano. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it must have been very beneficial, and uh, then it will help you a lot how to, you know, tackle different uh, uh, kinds of students, and also make them better person. Right. Yeah, certainly. So tomorrow morning, uh, from special guest. Yeah. But uh, we have to uh, wind up. Jinta told me it's from nine to ten. Ten. Is yes. That correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So tomorrow morning we're starting at nine. Yeah, please. Yeah. So then, thank you very much. And I can say that this group has been amazing and they worked so hard. And we're really, really happy to have been able to be here and, and very lucky and privileged to work with all of you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Well, I hope tomorrow will be oh, wonderful. Uh, maybe we can express this tomorrow. But uh, we are from outside. Uh, thank you very much for including us. And uh, it's uh, I mean, amazing in staying here for a few days. Thank you for the hospitality. And uh, we are very much I mean, appreciating the, what we have learned here. And uh, in future, I think this type of workshop might be needed for I mean, most of the teachers, if it can be for the other teachers too, it would be very nice. I mean, if the if it is possible, thank you very much for, maybe I will get opportunity, we will get opportunity tomorrow. But even then, I want to say this in advance. Thank you.
Well, that was a great, great surprise visit. Yeah. Is what? Every Saturday we get from China. Saturday. Really? <laughs> okay. So you can be a little bit in a volcano <laughs> when this happens. Uh, this is great, and also some uh, great words of wisdom. Why don't we have tea now? Okay. Hi, everybody. Before we get started, I know you're all sitting. I'm sorry, we should have done this before the tea break. But we have some articles here that I think would be really interesting for you. Two of them I think Sophie already gave to you. Um, some of them I'm going to be referring to today. Um, but they're really, I'm hoping that they'll be really helpful to you. So if you want to just come and pick them up, and then we'll get started. Uh, yeah, come and pick them up because there's too many to distribute. I think it'll take too long. So there, there are two that you must have received. The one f uh, from Dan Goldman and the preface from our curriculum. But if you haven't got it, just pick it, pick one up again. <laughs> Sorry, remember I told you we we have a Tibetan uh, a poster with Tibetan faces coming. So I'm gonna have that in in August. I'd rather have so keep those. But then you, I want to send the one with the the children's faces that are Tibetan, because that's much closer to you. Okay. All right. Okay. So I would love to get back to talking about specific cases, and there was a number of cases that we talked about during the tea break that I would like to bring back to the group. So we didn't really finish with uh, Dawala. We didn't finish talking about your student. Um, and I just wanted to talk about how when you have an angry student who you're worrying about having some, um, some experiencing some trauma because of a loss of parents, we have, and you've already done your feelings and needs and we've identified the need for love and attention and to belong. Now we know who's responsible for meeting needs. The teacher, are you responsible for meeting their needs or are they responsible for meeting their needs? Thank you, Vishnu. Vishnu. Yes, they are responsible for meeting their own needs. But Dao is saying, but how do we make sure, how can she meet her need for love and attention and belonging when she's 13, angry, and has lost her parents? It's a really good question. So here's the thing. Are you ready? There's multiple levels that this kid needs. So she suffered from a trauma. We need to make sure that she has some outside support from a counselor, from a psychologist who can deal with the big, heavy trauma. But in school, we need to help her to reflect on her need for attention and love and belonging. What can we do as a school? So at 13 years old, it's going to be hard for her. How do I meet my need for love and attention and belonging? If she knew, she probably would have already done it. So we have to help her as the adult reflect. If she was little, like three, uh, like primary three, grade two, grade one, grade three, grade four even, we would probably connect her with a teacher and say, who's your favorite teacher? Who do you think would be good to get a hug from at school when you come in, when you're worried, when you're angry? And we would set it up so that kid would get the love that they need. So in the case that Sophie mentioned, we had a mother commit suicide. We have a little girl who's very angry very often. And we've set her up with four teachers. So she named four teachers that she cares, that she likes. So when she's upset, she can go to those teachers and get a hug and get a little bit of support, have a, have a cuddle. She also knows that she can, if she's getting angry in class, she can leave class. She can find one of those teachers and she can meet her own need for love and connection. But we've set it up as the adults. So this girl is 13, 14 years old. It's going to be harder. But what we do is we find who is a teacher that, that we think she might be too angry to even say who a teacher would be. But you know, that, te that girl's really good at physical education. She loves gym. And you think, oh, that teacher kind of has a nice warm heart. I think that would be a good match. You would talk to the gym teacher first and say, you know what, we're really struggling with this girl. We need to find a way to make her feel like she belongs in our school and has purpose. And, but also, she needs a little bit of extra love. What, how, would it be OK if she came and helped you with one of your classes, maybe with a primary one or primary two? Maybe it's a, you know, can she come and help you set it up? Can she come and help run the class with you? I think this would really help her care for others. I think it would also really help her to connect with another adult. 
and you're going to help build it in. And then you're going to go to her and say, look, you know, I'm really worrying about you. I, I know we did your cards and I see you're angry and you're needing to belong and feel special. And, and, and I'm really worried and, and we're going to set you up with this counselor. But at school, I'm wondering if you'd like to spend some time with this gym teacher because she really needs some help. This is a very challenging group of little kids. You know, would it be interesting for you? And she might say yes. More likely, she'll say, I don't know, maybe. Say, let's try. And then she gets to go once a week or twice a week or whatever you can build in. And it's not something that works the first time. It's not one day it's all going to be fixed. No, it's going to be months and months. And you say, and you check in with her, let's try it. And then you ask her next week, how did it go? But over time, not only will she feel good because she's helping others. Remember we talked about caring, building resilience and building our, in our, our ability to empathize with others. She's also creating a relationship with a, hopefully a caring adult. And that adult can say, how are you doing today? Daula is, is worrying about you. What happened last night? Did you have a good sleep? Did you, whatever, you start talking about not school. You talk about building a relationship. And over time, she's going to love going to the gym and helping the little kids. And she's going to hopefully love spending time with that adult who's going to give her some caring. She's meeting her own need for attention and love and belonging. But you as the adult have helped set it up. Does that make sense? And if it doesn't work with the gym teacher, you're going to try again. It's constantly figuring out what's the puzzle and how can we help support the kids. But first, you need them to help a little bit themselves to understand clearly what's going on. So De Chen had another beautiful example. Actually, you both had an example. Um, would you like to share with the group your one of your examples? And we'll talk about it. Uh, in my, when I was in uh, homes last year, uh, in means uh, homeschool, TCV homes, uh, what happened, TCV, no, Tibetan homeschool, what happened was there was a one student, and she had a anger issue, and whenever she get angry, she used to bang her head on the wall, whatever, and whatever she gets, she will throw out, and, uh, she, and she don't have that much of a good friend, and she get easily fight with the, uh, those friends. She's uh, 13, 14 years. So anyone want to brainstorm how you might start a conversation with this girl? What's the first step, do you think? So the first step is just, yeah, and connect with your own feelings as an adult. So go and talk to her and say, when I see you getting really angry and I see you hitting your head against the wall, I'm getting really worried. I'm, I'm worried that you're going to hurt yourself. And I feel that there's, that it would really help if you, if you wanted to talk, would you be wanting to come and talk with me? Cause I'm worried. She might say, no, that's okay. All you're doing is you're saying, I'm seeing something and I'm caring about you and I want to help. And then the next day you'll go back and you'll say, Hey, you know what? Come and, come and sit with me. But you might have to do it privately. Because if she's with her friends, she's going to be like, no, no. But if you can find her in a moment where she's quiet and alone, you say, come, let's, let's talk. I'm, 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 this is worrying for me. You're owning your own feelings and your own needs. I'm worried. I need to understand. And your need to understand is going to help you to come and have a conversation with her. And you're going to start with the feelings and needs cards. And ask, put your feelings down, put your needs down. Maybe you're going to be surprised and she's going to come up and give you a clear sense of what she's needing and you can help her to reflect on what that need is. Maybe she won't, but you don't need to know the answers. You just need to initiate the conversation and try to connect. The kids really surprise us every time I have a conversation with them. Very rarely are they not able to put down what they're feeling and what they need. Rarely. Actually, it's never happened. Even kids who've never done, who've never been taught feelings and needs, they know. But first, they need a trusting relationship with you. And that takes time. And you're maybe not the right person. So you can say, I'm worrying about you, and I'd like to help, and I'd like to understand. Is there another teacher that would be, a, that you feel comfortable with? Let's say, let's get you guys together. It's just making sure that they are seen and that you're worried. 
the strategy that you put in place is kind of the easy part. It's the connecting and getting them to be able to be honest and vulnerable with you. So with Dei Chen, we were talking also that this girl is not successful academically. She has no friends, so she's failing in school. She doesn't have very many friends, and when she does have social interactions, she ends up getting angry and destroying those relationships. So, yeah. <laughs> so when I see a kid who's failing academically, who's angry, who's banging their head against the wall, I'm going to start thinking about not just, and oh, sorry, you also talked about their family situation, and it seemed to be okay, her family situation, right? Or is that, no? Connection. Okay. So again, we have another case of maybe someone that's feeling disconnected and, and has the need to love and belong. That's one problem. And, and you'll go one direction with that, which is finding a way to help them to feel connected and to belong. And the first step is to offer your own observation of caring. There are two articles here that we passed out on kids with learning disabilities. And the reason I thought it was in one of, they're both extremely old. So old, I can't even tell you the date. I couldn't find it on one of them. But the masks that students wear is probably, honestly, I don't even want to tell you the date, but it is probably one of the best articles I've ever read. Because kids who have a learning issue are often putting on a mask because they don't want you to think they're stupid. And they will show you any kind of behavior because to be the class clown, to be invisible and pretend they don't exist and be in the back of the class and don't say anything, um, to make everybody laugh is great. To be angry is great. To tell you that they don't care, this is stupid, it's boring, I don't care, I'm not going to do it, is great. It's way better than having you think that they're stupid. Because if you think they're stupid or their friends think they're stupid, it's the worst. So they have masks that they put on to, as their barrier to protect themselves so that you don't see the truth. And this girl that was failing in school and getting in problems socially and hitting her head against the wall made me think, hmm, I wonder if she's struggling academically and she needs a different kind of help than we're offering. And I don't know if you how much training you get in identifying kids with learning issues and then how to support them afterwards. But it's really important to know that kids with true learning disabilities have average or above average intelligence. So these are kids who are smart, who you think could be doing better, and often get la at labeled as lazy and mischievous and naughty, but they're not. Yep. Which part? That often kids who have learning disabilities have average or above average intelligence. Okay. <laughs> they're very smart kids, but they're struggling. And when they struggle, they don't want you to know, and they're going to pretend, and they're going to use their very smart skills to hide. One of the uh, things that happened also that she mentioned is that, or maybe this was a different case, that she copied... That was a different girl. So she didn't do her own homework. She copied her own. Ho she copied someone else's homework. If you catch a kid copying someone else's homework often, and then this girl tried to cut herself, because if you've catch if you caught them copying, what's going to happen? They've copied their whole life. Oh my God! Now you've caught me. What am I going to do? My life is over. I'm going to fail. I'm going to get in trouble. I'm. That's. You need to connect with that person and find out what is happening. Yeah. Sure. Dei Chen was the one that that she cut her wrist, right? Yeah. I didn't make that up. It came from her. <laughs> we see a lot of cutting behaviors in North America, and I'm sad that you're seeing it here too. So the idea is that if a kid has a learning difficulty, they're going to hide it from you. And how you handle that is going to be critical. OK, so I'm going to go to It was one of, one of your examples. Um, if you have a learning issue and you don't know what it is, I don't know whether you have had a lot of learning, so maybe I'm going to repeat it. 
but you need to f spend some time with a student to kind of do and ident to identify what the issue is. I don't know if you do formal assessments, if you have psychologists that do educational assessments. Do you have that? Formal testing? No? Okay. So that's too bad. Because you, you can go to a psychologist, an educational psychologist, and they'll do a certain evaluation and they'll be able to say, cognitively, wow, this kid is very smart. And then academically, or maybe their profile is like this. And academically, their profile could be like this also, or maybe they're good at math and terrible at something else. So it's also not an even profile. And then we can identify what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, and then how do we implement as teachers a program that's going to help them to be successful. But if you don't have that, then you need to figure out as a teacher, how do you figure it out? So I can give you my five second assessment. Yep. I just wanted to add, there are assessments in place, but uh, these assessments may not be available in the schools. Okay. And they may not be counselors trained to administer them and score them and interpret them. Which is too bad, because it's really important, because for sure in every class you have, there's going to be a kid with a learning disability. I'm quite certain. Maybe more than one. The other test in India, but those tests are like kind of quite expensive. Yeah. And sometimes there are a cultural bias issue. Yeah. So we never try, yeah. You're absolutely right. In North America, they're super expensive too. There are more assessments, and many of them are actually quite not expensive. They're actually quite within the range. Uh, would you try an enhanced bias? We'll talk about this. Okay. Thank you. But it's okay. You know what? In in Canada, in North America, we have the same thing. To get a proper psycho a psychoeducational assessment, it's like two thousand dollars. We don't have families that can afford two thousand dollars. We do have schools that offer them for free, but the lit the waiting list is huge. Okay, so we're going to assume, and they have the cultural bias, which makes it even worse. Okay, so let's assume you have a kid in your class. They're failing. They're or maybe they have already failed a grade, so they're even more angry than they were before. They're cutting or they're hitting their head. They're socially not accepted. So what do you do? So the first thing you need to do as a teacher is figure out what is going on. If they seem to come from a solid family or a family that seems OK, if you are puzzled, we need to first try to do like um a modified assessment. So let's say you're going to get a piece of text that is being asked to be read by the class. This is your, something you're doing privately, right? You're doing it privately one-on-one -on -one, and you're doing it as the teacher or you're doing it as the school counselor. And you want them to read that text out loud. And then you're going to listen and you're going to say, is it a decoding problem? They're having a hard time reading. Or you might be shocked. I've seen grade nine kids who cannot read. But they are so smart and so socially savvy that they have made it all the way through grade nine to grade nine and no one has figured it out. No one. So you get this kid and they are having trouble reading. They're sounding out, but they're really struggling. Okay, so that kid needs help to learn how to read. That's one kind of support, which I'm happy to explain at some other time. If the kid's reading fluently, okay, they finish, and then you say, can you tell me back, what did you just read in your own words? Maybe the kid has no clue. No clue. Then you're like, oh, that's a reading comprehension problem. That's a different type of support you're going to offer the kid. Let's say in a longer text, it's a processing problem. They're reading, but they're not processing. They're picking up the details, but not the main idea. Oh, that's a different kind of problem. Maybe their reading is fine. Ask them to do some, a little bit of writing. Give them a topic off the top of your head. Write about your favorite memory. Look at their writing. All of a sudden you see big letters, small letters all over the place. Their spelling is terrible or they're spelling phonetically. You can read what they're saying because it sounds how, they're, how you would write it, but it's terrible. Okay, that's a different kind of problem. Maybe their writing is fine, but it makes no sense. All the ideas are there, but they're all mixed up. That's a different kind of problem. But all of these are signs of a learning disability that if you're being asked to do a lot of work, or let's say you're writing on the board and they have to take down notes, they can't do that. Can't do board to, te to, the, to the table. Can't do it. That's another kind of problem. Each of these problems has a solution. 
Some of them are harder than others, I grant you, but there's a solution. But if you have a kid who's every day coming into class and is being asked to do something that is virtually impossible for them or extremely difficult for them, how will they feel? Angry. So angry. Will they have a lot of tolerance when you speak to them? No. Will they have a lot of tolerance with their friends socially? No. Are they going to potentially self-mutilate? Yes. Are they going to be physically aggressive with other kids? Yes. Are they going to become involved in risk-taking behaviors, smoking, whatever? Yes. So we need to always find out why is a kid behaving the way they're behaving? We can't assume that we know. We have to figure it out. And it's a very slow but careful process. And you can do it as with the feelings and needs as a starting point. You can do it with an informal assessment of what I've just described. But the, all, the whole time you're saying, I see you, I care, I want to help, and I want you to be successful. That's what all kids need. And when you develop that trusting relationship, and you're and you and you can find some solutions it makes a huge difference so all the masks that kids wear could indicate a learning disability it may not it could indicate some very difficult family dynamics it may not but there's always something behind the behavior and it's all of our jobs to figure out what that is you don't need the answer you don't need to be alone but as a team, we need to figure out why is this kid behaving the way they are and what are we going to do to help? So in Dawa's case, we're going to send them to us, make sure they have some special support outside of school because they've experienced trauma. And we'll try to set up their favorite teacher so they can have a situation where they're helping and they're getting some reward, some caring and resilience. In your situation, you have a kid hitting your head against the wall. We're going to figure out, is this a learning disability? What's going on? Now, you had another situation that maybe we could talk about. Uh, it's for a boy uh, who is in class 9. It's, uh, he has uh, this anger issue. So every teacher, subject teacher, has a problem with that boy. So that boy is not ready to learn. So when in the class, uh, he always tend to sleep. So when teacher asks question, it just uh, he show anger, and that's the real problem. So when we try to talk with the him, he's not ready to talk. When we call him for the office, he's not coming, and we have to run after him. And even then, like he's not coming. When we ask question, so he's like kind of uh, manipulate, manipulating things. So it's very hard, you know. And then uh, last year he got failed, and this year he is repeating the same class. Uh, it's class nine. Yeah. Yeah, 14, 15. And it's not like uh, he has, uh, it seems like he, he doesn't have any family problem because his uh, mother is always visiting every weekend. His mother is coming. But one thing is that his mother is not uh, meeting with any of the teacher. So that's what teacher is also, all the teachers are all, also very like, uh, you know, kind of surprised why this mother is not coming to meet us. Yeah. What do you think the first step is? Uh, what I think is that the first step would be to build a rapport, build a rapport with that student. Yeah, so and then it's going to take a time. So as soon as you build a rubber with the student, then we have to, uh, we, I think we can work on feeling and needs now. Now I know the feeling and needs, so then uh, we can work on that feeling and need and then see the things. Yeah. And then that might be the perfect kind of case that you might want to do this kind of, um, um, this type of kind of um, testing where you're going to kind of look for different pieces of the puzzle in terms of academics. Can he read? Can he understand what he's reading? Can he write? Can he spell? This informal, I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to say. Do an informal evaluation to see if you can figure out where it's tricky for him. Um, so I, I'm going to do a full disclosure here. Oh, yeah, before I do my full disclosure. 
I'm really sorry to interrupt you like that, but I really didn't know that you were going to come up with a disclosure at all. I was thinking about her. Sometimes adolescents, like you are facing here, even I don't know the history of what has happened, but they tend to throw a challenge, especially at those who are supposed to be healing them. Uh, you don't know me. Figure it out. You don't know me. You don't know anything. Possibly that is how they will think. That's the communication. So the more you go after them, the more that will reinforce their way of thinking. It's quite oppositional in a sense. So, so yeah. So if you go after them, you put more rules on them, uh, it, will, it will worsen. So uh, yes, the, the starting one, I don't know what the starting point would be myself, but I would also want to know how to connect with him, how to possibly just sit by his side for five minutes and see if he speaks something. When could that time be? Uh, could it be the start of the day or towards the end of it? <laughs> so, it's, it's often common with adolescents. That, that's the only point. They, they sometimes test. So, I totally agree. But what's interesting, there's two things. What, what Wassel said at the very beginning was the first step is building rapport. And that's exactly what you're talking about. So I think you're both saying the same thing. Building rapport and finding a common ground is going to be take some time, but that's the first step. And then the other thing, there's an article also on the adolescent brain. And the adolescent brain is continuing to develop. And I wish we had more time because I would really like to talk about the adolescent brain and how that impacts our learning and our ability to connect because that's kind of a big piece of the puzzle too. Um, I was going to say something else, but I forget. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll do my full disclosure. Okay. So um, my full disclosure is that before... Um, before working with social emotional learning, I spent 50 or 10 to 15 years talk, learning, um, doing assessments of learning disabilities and supporting teachers in the classroom and doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring with kids. And the reason I did that is because I myself have a learning disability. So I was diagnosed as having a language-based learning disability, commonly called dyslexia. So I was a terrible speller. I still am. Um, reading was something that was really very slow and laborious for me. Now I'm a very good reader, but then it was slow. And if you're slow at decoding, you often don't get the meaning or the understanding. So I would pick up details, but not the main theme or the main point. So my point is that I wasn't an angry kid. I was the easy kind of kid who really wanted to be successful. So I worked really hard and I went and I talked to my teachers at lunch or at recess and my mom would help me with my homework after school. I was lucky, but that's my personality. But my point is that what took everybody else 10 minutes to do probably took me an hour to do. So if you don't have that very loving, connected school and family, you're not very likely to spend the hour doing it when everyone else takes five minutes or 10 minutes. So my other point of telling you this is that if I had a learning difficulty, does that mean that I'm not smart? No, I felt not smart. I felt stupid. But if you look at my cognitive profile, I'm actually pretty smart. And I do have my PhD, so I guess I am OK smart. <laughs> but, but it takes much longer. And most kids is, don't recognize that if they have to work harder, they think they're stupid. And that takes a toll on your self-esteem, which impacts all kinds of places in your life. So it's really important for all the cases and all the behaviors that we find the root cause. Most of the kids that I work with that have learning disabilities were not like me. And they are angry. And it is much harder. And it's complicated. So do we want to talk about another case? Yeah. Uh, I just want to say that, I mean, uh, I witnessed that the problem is not always from the student side, but uh, I think the problem is more serious from the teachers and administrators and uh, and uh, in such cases, you know, if it is a student, it's okay, we have counselor and you can talk with them, at least they will listen to us. But uh, I witness, you know, 
in many cases the problem is from the <laughs> teacher or of course um, i mean all the teachers do not have the you know um, psychological you know knowledge or all these things and even from the administrator side and in uh, schools you know we have got many people cooks and then you know there are many many people involved so if one is disturbed one student is disturbed he's more disturbed from other sides so the problem you know aggravates and grows more so such things is very i mean very visible in our schools so a number of really important points we need a strong leader who understands the importance of social and emotional learning and values it so that they encourage their teachers to learn what it is. Then we have teachers that need to understand and connect to themselves because teacher wellness, as we've mentioned a million times, is so critical. So you need to have good self-awareness so you can connect with yourself. But when we go into schools, I'm not going to lie to you, there's four types of teachers we find. We find the teachers that really get social emotional learning and get excited and they take the tools and they run with it and they're amazing and they have, they're already doing a lot of really good things in their class. They're just taking some extra bits and making their classes even better. And then we have teachers who are like, I don't really get this, but I want to get this and they need a little help. And so we can go into their classes and co-teach. Or we can just talk to them like we do a teacher training here and then we offer the support. We offer a coaching support so we're going to talk to you about um, how to set up either like webinars or conference calls so that when you come up with cases you can call us and we can brainstorm over the phone and we can help you because when you do it the first time in a classroom it might be a disaster. They might call and say I did something wrong because this did not work and then we're going to talk about it. That's another kind of teacher. If that's the majority. They're fantastic. I love working with those teachers. Then there's teachers that say, this is garbage. I don't want to do it. I don't care about it. I think it's not important. I'm going to focus on math, and I don't want to talk to you. And I say, no problem. Please don't do it. Go do your math. And if you see the other teacher is having really good results, and you want to do it next year, terrific. Call me. But then there's one kind of teacher who I call a very dangerous kind of teacher. And those are teachers that think they're good and say they'll do this and tell their t kids that they're doing this and they don't. So those are the teachers that are often yelling at their kids, talking badly about the kids to their colleagues in front of other kids, putting kids down, name calling, naughty, lazy, disturbing, destructive, problem kids. And they are lacking some self-awareness themselves. And they are in a lot of suffering because they don't know how to do it. They want to. Some of them have very good intentions. They want to do it. They think they're doing it, but they're not. And because they think they're doing it, it's very hard to help them. Those are the teachers that scare me. <laughs> Teaching disability. I love it. And those, those are teachers we struggle with. When we have teachers like this, we we ask the principal or um, of the school to help. That maybe they will have to have a discussion at some point, uh, because when they, what what we're doing here, well, just I'll just back up a little bit. So Tara was showing you today how to use the cell model for intervention. We call that the cell glasses. That means you put those on and you check what's happening, and you know where to intervene, and it gives you clues on what kind of interventions you can do. Uh, when, where was I going with this? Oh my God, I'm like, I think we're getting tired. <laughs> the, when, when we're doing this with teachers, well, I'll go back to the, the, the teachers which, uh, with, which is very difficult to work with, the ones who think they're doing it, and then we hear they're shouting in the class, the kids are scared of them, they don't want to talk to the teacher. Uh, we have a chat we try to help the teacher, we try to give methods, and if it doesn't work, because we're implementing as a school, we, we're changing our system. This is a shift in paradigm in our school. It's not just bringing in a new topic we're gonna teach because this is good. We're, teach, we're changing the way we have relationships together, and this is where the principle is, is key. Because when the relationships are not happening, uh, it's, it's hard from, you know, colleague to colleague sometimes to intervene and you need some higher intervention 
And maybe the principal will have to have a chat with that teacher. But again, not, not from a <laughs> punitive point of view, from a, okay, so how are things and how's it going? And, and we do get feedback from the parents. My kid is terrified, doesn't want to go to school this morning. It's been like this for a whole week. She's scared of the teacher. <laughs> well, the principal will have to address this. And we will bring this teacher back to the cell model. But again, it's, this is an intervention. Give concrete tools to that teacher and easy things to implement or change, not, not change everything. Um, and try to work with that teacher closer. So this teacher needs more coaching, but it also needs support from the principal, in my opinion. One, one thing that's worked well in um, some of the schools that we've worked in is that we don't do an implementation in the whole school right away. We do a pilot project. So we asked, we might give a training to all the teachers in terms of what is social emotional learning. And then after that training, we'll say from that school, who's interested in doing more? Who would like to implement this in their classes this year? And then the teachers self-select. So the teachers that are keen come and we support them and they become the models and the mentors of teachers who then want to bring it into their own classes. Or we have something called the pillars. So we have maybe some key teachers in the school. Often it's a counselor and a behavior tech. I don't know if you, person that t deals with the behavior problems the most. So we'll have counselors, behavior techs, and teachers who are keen and interested with the administration. The principal is really important to be on board. And those become the pillars so that the other teachers know when they're struggling with a student, these are the ki these are the teachers, the adults in the school that you can refer the kids to. So I might be a science teacher or an English teacher and I don't know cell, I don't get cell, I don't want to know about cell, but I know this kid in front of me is struggling. I'm going to say, let's, let's set you up with Sophie because Sophie's going to be your point person. I think Sophie can help you with this. And sometimes it's okay to be self-aware that this isn't your thing. It's perfect. It's a better, better way to go. But we have some key people in the school who can support or who you can invite into your classroom, who can do temperature, who can help you implement feelings and needs, who can set up a connect corner. So we have kind of two models. One is this pillars, and one is a pilot model where some teachers are doing it, and then it grows as you see success. Uh, there's um, we work with someone who does research she's a fantastic educator she was a teacher for years and then she became a teacher for the worst you know considered the worst case children she was in a special school where you know all this th these kids had been expelled from all their schools and they had nowhere else to go she's teaching there she is so good with any kind of behavior and she did some research also to see what was happening in because she she loves training teachers and it, here's what she found out and it's really interesting like this is also what happens in our schools. It's we have something like this. And if these are all the teachers, about 20% here, this is the green zone. This is the go-getters. They love it. They're going to do it. Teachers who eat it, you know, they, they eat their material. They, they just want to teach. They, they love what they're doing basically. And they start all kinds of projects in the school. They're good at mobilizing people. 20%. She calls it the green zone. And then after that, and you have something like this, all of this, what, what, maybe it's what, 90%, 90? Um, 80. Hmm? Well, 70%? 70, okay. 70% is like, they don't know where they're going to go. They're, they're, they're enthusiastic teachers, but, you know, if, if things, if things are fun and, and some colleagues are doing some fun things, they, they, they might be contaminated and going this way. But if, in your school, this little 5%, these are teachers who are quite, they resist, they, they're, they, they're good at contaminating negative. the rest of the teachers in, in a negative way. What do you want to say? Negative. Yeah, negative. She calls it the red zone. So in your school, these teachers, if, when they get unhappy about something and then they, they, they really get you know, fixated on an issue that they don't like and then that contaminates the group, you have a chance of this group going this way. So when you start a project like Cell or something like that, what you want to do is give it out to the teachers here. But we're, this is the kind of thing we talk about to principals of school when we give a workshop. The principals have to come and they have to understand that 
This is generally speaking what we see in a school in terms of teaching staff. So we target, you need to know who's who, you need to know who to target when you're implementing something new and you need to make sure that these guys really buy in because that's going to contaminate pretty much everyone in your school. And that's how we start. But if we impose something and it's hard and it's kind of messy at the beginning, oh my goodness, it might go this way. And that's not fun. So anyway, this is just a, as we say in French, une petite parenthèse. A very important. Parenthèse. That's again uh, more of a disclosure. Uh, this time I'm teaching undergraduate students uh, who are pre-service trainee teachers. Uh, prior to this, I was with master's student, and this, this is quite some time earlier. So it did happen sometimes that I would actually, you know, given my situation of uh, dealing with the class, I might actually end up yelling, like the term that you used. Uh, I don't know why. I think it does help to go back to the class and make it very common with them later. That my intention to do this, I'm talking about grown-ups, please. Uh, that's the distinction. I said masters and undergraduate, not small children. So uh, it does happen. And I can tell you, surprisingly, that your rapport with them does not break. If you go back and tell them very honestly that that yelling was you not controlling yourself rather than they being good or bad, and that you're working on it. That no, 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 I'm not sure about that. No, no, but really. Yeah. It really happens, I promise you. We all get dysregulated from time to time. We all lose our tempers from time to time. And whether it's because we're a mother and we're doing it at our house or a father, or whether you do it in front of your class, it will happen. You are not perfect. You will lose your temper. And you'll end up either yelling at them or being frustrated with them or it's okay. I don't know. It's, it's a very spontaneous call. If you happen to just yell at someone and uh, spoil their day and you're not feeling good about having done that, you, it will take you back to the class after 10 minutes, 20 minutes or in your next class, you will go up and share that. So I think that is what keeps the bond with the class. Yeah. You have to own so it. You have, to own your, no you have to own your own that, that, emotions that, that, and no you own the fact that you become dysregulated as an adult yeah, sometimes. Yeah. It's okay. And going back and telling your class that you made a mistake is good. And if you happen to yell at a particular student, yeah. okay, that part is less good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because that really could do damage, but it could happen, but you really need to repair it with that student because that's personal and that's really not so. super. But to be doing a class and everyone's talking and not paying attention and it's not working, it's okay to own it and say, man, this is not yeah, working yeah. and I'm angry afterwards and I shouldn't have yelled at you. But, you know, but it's okay because we're human. That's the whole point. Know what you feel, know what your needs are, and own them. Perhaps not uh, pointing a particular student, but yes, sometimes it does happen. And uh, again, the more one yells, the point from the uh, workshop, like I see, is, is quite harmful for oneself only. And then it always deteriorates the relation. So yes, owning it up before the class, I think, is really the best way if it has happened. Uh, remember this connect before correct? So when we lose it, we're disconnected from us first. So, and, and this happens, and if you reflect on that after, uh, I don't know. Understand. Magic happens by that because students who didn't used to speak to me, I'm, I'm sharing not just from the current teaching assignment, but also from the previous one where students were from masters, so a little higher up, they used to come to speak afterwards. When they, when they knew that the, the person is of that kind, then they come over. That wall breaks, so that, that's great. You're building relationships. Okay, I think it's time to go outside for yep. a little bit. So leave all your stuff. We're going to go outside for five minutes, and then you're done. Yeah. And oh, wait, 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 wait. What? We said we're going to give uh, PowerPoints to the teachers who wanted to present in our school. Are we going to do that tomorrow? Any Anybody who wants the yes. PowerPoint, bring your USB key tomorrow, and we'll put it on. And we thought about building it with you, but actually, you know what? We're going to give it to you like this, and you keep in, keep 
and take out what you don't like because we found this quite comprehensive as it is and if you want to add stuff also we can help you but it's quite good well it's quite good i don't want to say them <laughs> we, we think it's quite comprehensive and it's not too hard to understand in that sense so tomorrow bring your usb key okay so we're going to go outside and form a circle yep not more than five minutes oh, yeah.